Thank you for joining us and welcome to Grace. As we bring our study on the love relationship called marriage to a conclusion, let's do a quick summary. Uh, these are some of the major points we've discussed thus far in our, in our marriage series. Uh, point number one, for those who want to take notes, God has given marriage instructions to marriage partners through the Apostle of Grace, the Apostle Paul. Uh, that would be point number one. Point number two, the primary instruction for marriage partners is that husbands are to love their wives in the same way or in the same manner that Christ loved the church. Uh, we, looked at that, um, we looked at that statement there from Paul in Ephesians. Uh, point number three, wives are to be subject to their husbands in the same manner that the church is to be subject unto Christ. That's point number three. Point number four, in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter five, Paul presents God's parallel marriage picture showing the correlation between Christ's union with the church and the union of marriage participants. So there's a parallel structure Paul presents there. Uh, point number five, when we see what Christ accomplished for the church, we can see the needs of the church. Thus we have the needs of every wife. Paul's given us that parallel structure. Point number six, the epistle where Paul tells us how Christ loved the church is his letter to the saints in Rome, the, the, the Romans epistle, otherwise known as the book of Romans, where we find the doctrines of justification, uh, we call that a safe place, sanctification, and from that uh, cornerstone called sanctification, we know that God has given us a special place, so we see that the wife needs a special place, and then the third cornerstone, dispensation, which we call a close place, a, a place of unbroken access. Uh, so three needs there, it's the husband's responsibility to provide these needs uh, that his wife will have. Point number seven, the major life realms where husbands are to provide a safe place for their wives and where clear dispensation doctrine, uh, grace age dispensation doctrine is provided are the areas of faith, finances, family, friendships, physical intimacy, and then there are five issues after that that should never be uh, permitted uh, space in a marriage relationship, and they are adultery, addiction, abuse, absence or abandonment, and anger. And all of these are, are broad-ranged areas, as we said, and uh, addiction uh, takes place in many areas. And uh, we've gone through these things, but these are the points. Uh, point number eight, the special place husbands are to provide for their wives relates to the emotional sensitivities of the woman. Uh, this is why the woman is called the weaker vessel in scripture. And according to uh, the Bible, we're to honor uh, that in the woman. Point number nine, given the woman's relational makeup, husbands can provide the wife's emotional and relational needs through the application of relational words such as time. In fact, uh, the apostle Paul used that very word, that uh, time in the Greek, or time, uh, uh, written out time. Time, talk, touch, tenderness, uh, affection that has to do with attitude and action, all words that have to do with caring and sensitivity uh, that, that, uh, that come to play in that relational makeup of the woman, along with words like thoughtfulness and uh, trust and truth. Uh, they all fit in there. Uh, point number 10, to cl the close place husbands are to provide their wives relates to the communication uh, uh, connection, we might say, that has to do with listening uh, that results in actually hearing and caring about what is being said. Point number 11, very quickly. According to the parallel picture, sitting in Ephesians chapter 5 once again, finding what the union partner of the church, which would be Christ, desires from the church will tell us what every husband will have a desire when it comes uh, to his marriage relationship. That'll be the husband's needs as we related it. Point number 12. God made Christ the head of the church for a purpose. Uh, he made Christ the head of the church so that in all things Christ might receive the preeminence in the minds of those who comprise, uh, comprise the church. Thus, the great desire of every husband from his wife is going to be that same word, preeminence. The parallel structure stays in place. Point number 13, our final point today, preeminence has nothing to do with capacity or equality. Uh, it has everything to do with being given foremost consideration, otherwise called first place. Uh, so this is the preeminence issue. We'll talk more about this today. Uh, this is where we'll pick up our study. Uh, today as we continue with the remaining few points before we bring our study on marriage to a conclusion. Looking back at point 11 for a moment, and we'll do that before we move on forward, we found that preeminence has to do with first place, as I said earlier. 
That's the meaning of that Greek word protos or protos, uh, from which we get our English word preeminence. Understand once again, we're not talking about first place in the sense of the husband being better than his wife or having greater importance in the marriage relationship uh, that, than his wife. This isn't about who is more important. Uh, the preeminence we're talking about here has nothing to do with capacity or equality, uh, which was point number 13. The roles of, of both marriage partners are of equal value to God, but they are different roles. And they are different roles by way of God's design. Both roles should be celebrated and neither role should be coveted. <clears throat> when we began looking at the needs of the husbands in their marriage relationships, we ran across the reason that God the Father made his son to be head of the church. Uh, we're given that reason. How do we know that preeminence is the number one desire of every husband when it comes to the love actions of his wife? Uh, we discovered that by looking at that parallel picture once again, sitting in Ephesians 5, uh, a marvelous picture Paul paints, verse 23, along with Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, we'll pull both passages up before us uh, one, once again. And uh, First, let's look at Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, now Paul paints the parallel, even as Christ is the head of the church, or in the same way that Christ is the head of the church, and Christ is the Savior of the body. Now, why is Christ uh, the head of the body of Christ? Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 tells us the reason why that is so. Here Paul writes, and he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, meaning the believers of Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ. Christ, who is the beginning, the first fruit from the dead, and here's where the purpose clause comes in. He's the head of the church so that, so that in all things he, Jesus Christ, who was the head of the body, might have, and here's our word, the preeminence. Again, God the Father isn't better. Uh, he's not more important or of greater significance than God the Son. Uh, yet God the Father has the headship position in the Godhead. Uh, he doesn't boss his son around, tell his son what to do and when to do it and how he's going to do it. Um, they're one. Likewise, the husband isn't any better or more important or of greater significance than his wife. Both are equally important to God and of equal importance in the marriage relationship. But just as husbands are to honor their wives and to love them in the same way that Christ loved the church, those who hold the position called headship in the marriage relationship uh, that God established desire to be given the preeminence in the minds of, of those to whom they are joined. And of course, that's the need, first need, primary need of every husband. God's desire concerning the body of Christ is that, that those people join to his son because they've believed the gospel of Christ. Um, that, his, that those people join to his son give his son the preeminence that his headship role desires, uh, uh, or, or deserves rather. This is, this is what we're to do. The greatest desire of all husbands, whether they realize it or not, or, or whether they receive it or not, is to be given a place of preeminence by their wives. Uh, this is all part of the parallel picture that Paul painted for us in chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. So what is preeminence once again? We need to explore that word a little further. What does it mean? Uh, preeminence can be summed up in two words. Uh, primary consideration. Primary consideration. So let's look at it further and let's, let's dig into this word. The dictionary has this to say about the word consideration. The relevant factor in assessing something. The relevant factor in assessing something. Not a relevant factor. The Bible said, or the dictionary rather, says it's the relevant factor. Uh, the word preeminence tells us that God wants us to, God wants to be first. He wants to be the foremost consideration in the minds of his creation. Uh, now, he desires that his human creation have the same mindset toward his son because he made his son to be head over all things to the church. So think about it in light of the definition we've just read. The opposite of being preeminent would be that thing or person who has uh, little importance or significance in the mind of another individual. Christ should be the number one consideration, as we said, primary consideration when it comes to the things that are said and done by those who are joined in union relationship to God the Son. Uh, Paul's telling us through this parallel picture that he's painted for us that husbands have that same desire when it comes to their wives. Uh, when we consider the greatest need of the man, namely preeminence once again, this is where it becomes most interesting. Uh, we know what Christ accomplished for the church through his death in our place for our sins, his burial, 
taking those sins off the table of God's justice forevermore, and through his resurrection from the dead, our justification. Uh, it becomes obvious to me that we could, we could spend eternity uh, serving him and never outgive the God-man who gave uh, on our behalf. But with all that he's already given, including the giving of his own life on our behalf, Christ isn't through giving uh, to those who are joined to him. Now, this is an interesting uh, concept here. I, I know you're familiar with this passage. It sits in Paul's marriage manual, as I like to think of it, uh, the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, where Paul made this astounding statement about our giving God. So let's take a quick look at it. We'll begin with verse 6, where we see the position in which God placed those who have believed the gospel of Christ. Here it is, Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 6. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we've been given a marvelous position. That. Now when something, when a sentence starts with that, we know it's a purpose clause. So that. It's a purpose. So that uh, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now think about what you've just read. In other words, there will be no end to the kindness of Christ Jesus toward his union partner, the church. It doesn't end with our, with our uh, life here on earth. Paul said, so that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. Uh, in his kindness uh, uh, toward us through Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? So that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in the ages to come? Uh, is the Apostle Paul telling us that the cross of Christ was the foundation, we might say the focal point, we might even say the master stroke of God's genius when it came to the giving of God and his son, but that he has much more in store for those who are joined to his son? Uh, this is interesting to contemplate, isn't it? As I said, who can outgive God? And, and that will be on the that we'll be on the, on the receiving end of his kindness toward, toward us in the ages to come. Uh, it's a fascinating concept. So who would you say is the primary giver when it comes to Christ and the church? It should really go without saying Christ has done far more for us folks than we could ever do for him. No believer will or could ever outgive the Savior. Now, when it came to the gift of his son, we were God's what? We were his primary consideration. The question is, do we give him as much? Uh, we've already discussed the safe place, the special place, and the close place that we have in Christ Jesus being joined to him. Uh, those three things have, have been met for the church, and those three needs are the responsibility of every husband, as we've been talking about over and over here, to fulfill for his wife. Those three needs of the wife are the threefold formula that husbands are to pour on their wives uh, daily, as we illustrated earlier. How many of us do it? Well, not very many of us, and we might think of it for a time, and then uh, we're back to putting the formula bottle on the shelf. Um, but now we've come to the desire of the husband when it comes to his wife, and the first desire we run across is that word preeminence. What I want you to see comes in connection with this passage from the Apostle Paul about wives. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29. Let's take a quick look. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth, that's the three-part formula we've already examined, it's a food, um, the safe place, the special place, the close place, but now notice the word and that follows the word nourisheth. Nourisheth and, additionally, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. To cherish something is to treasure it, it's to, to revere it, to esteem it, to... Uh, to attach utmost importance to that which is cherished. Uh, if your wife were the object of utmost importance in your life, would you not also consider her first in all matters pertaining to your life? Uh, the answer is, of course you would. That is, if you cherish her in the way that God instructed she be cherished by her husband, she would be your primary consideration. If you're a married man, your wife should be your primary concern or your primary consideration. But wait a minute. That's the meaning of the word preeminence. Uh, you have a need to be her primary concern, preeminent in her mind, but the fact is she should be the foremost consideration in your life as well uh, because that's what the word cherish really means. So in a very real sense, each spouse should be preeminent in the mind of the other spouse. Each spouse should be the other spouse's primary consideration. And we men thought that preeminence was all about us. Uh, well, not so. Husbands might say, wait. 
It looks like I'm responsible to do far more of the giving in my marriage than my wife. I know husbands might say that, but reason it through. Did Christ not do more of the giving when it came to the church? I think we've already seen that he did. I want to carry this thought a little further before we look at the second need of the husbands in their marriage relationships. Why do many wives have a problem when it comes to giving their husband the place of primary consideration that every husband is due? And I can tell you many wives do have a problem there. We might ask that same question from a different direction. Why do women leave men to begin with? Have you ever thought about that? Well, there's been many studies. You know that women initiate, and this is proven, now this, these are the statistics, women initiate the vast majority of the marriage counseling that takes place today. The women are the initiators of the marriage counseling. But that same tr fact is true when it comes to divorce. The men aren't requesting counseling, not for the most part, that is. Even those men who are unhappy in their marriage relationships. It's the wives who seek out the counseling in most instances, according to statistics. And in a good many cases, that search comes just this side of saying goodbye to a marriage relationship. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us then to find that women are also the primary initiators of divorce. And that, those statistics are absolutely true. It's by a two-to-one ratio that we're told. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that wives are to love their husbands, but the Apostle doesn't stop there. He goes on. Paul goes on when we consider the parallel picture in Ephesians chapter 5 to define how the wives are to love their husbands. This won't come naturally to a wife, just as the way we're to love our wives won't come naturally to, to the husbands. We're wired differently. Um, the, wives, the wives are to make their husbands the foremost consideration in their lives. Uh, they are to be the subject to their husbands in everything. So in every area, their husband should be their primary consideration. That's preeminence by the very definition of that word, as we've seen. With that being said, there's a, a lot of wives who might ask, how can I give my husband the foremost place of consideration in my life when my relationship with my husband is the biggest frustration of my life? And you know that a lot of wives would say that very thing. You see, wives see themselves as being the ones responsible for resolving the conflicts, or at least the ones interested in resolving those conflicts, while the husbands of those troubled marriages see things entirely differently. Uh, both are sincere. They're both just viewing things differently, viewing things from a different angle. Don't think that husbands don't get as equally frustrated as do the wives, because that's true. Uh, they do. Talk to husbands in unhappy marriage relationships, and many of them will tell you that from their point of view, their wives' expectations are out of reach. Uh, they don't think they get the credit that they deserve for what they do contribute to the marriage, uh, most husbands would say. So like the wives, the husbands of these unhappy marriage relationships become frustrated. Uh, relationship frustration uh, is not a gender-reserved condition. Uh, from the man's perspective, the onus is always on them, but become, it becomes, uh, they need in their own thinking, they think from their wise perspective, they need to become better financial supporters. They're always failing in the finance department, even when times are tough. Uh, and then the onus is on them to become better fathers. There's always a better, better, better need where, where men are concerned when they think about the mind of their wives. There's always that need for them to become more caring. Uh, and more sensitive husbands. Uh, in short, they don't feel they can ever measure up uh, to what their wives expect of them. Uh, they feel they are the subjects of condemnation much more often than the subjects of admiration when it comes to the mind of their wives. That's how men feel. Instead of being the recipient of foremost consideration in the minds of their wives, many married men will tell you they feel like they are always at the forefront of their wife's criticism. There are a lot of married guys out there who resolve their frustration by adopting the attitude that wives are just born to complain. How many of you have heard that? Wives are just born to complain. Um, they'll have to ignore it in order to survive it, these men think. Uh, that's how the guys reason it. The truth is, there are very few men who feel like they measure up to the guy their wife really wanted and hoped she'd found when she married him. Not early on. But later on in the relationship, this comes to the front, forefront. This is how a lot of unhappily married men see it. Of course, the wives of those unhappy relationships see it differently. So who is right and who is wrong 
uh, when it comes to this issue. If giving a husband the place of preeminence is a problem, uh, let's look more closely at why that problem exists from the wife's perspective. Let's talk about why wives want to leave relationships in the first place. And the statistics are in. The polls have been taken. This may shed further light on the frusta frustration that a lot of wives feel and why giving their husbands primary consideration is a foreign concept to many of our married ladies. Here's an interesting statistic. Do you know that the most common reason women give when they're asked to give a, a reason for leaving their husbands? There, there's, a, there's one answer that uh, is given more often than any other answer. Many states allow divorce applicants to simply state irreconcilable differences, but not all states. Uh, they can put irreconcilable differences on the marriage application, and that'll be sufficient grounds for the divorce in, in some states. But the question remains, what are those irreconcilable differences? What are they? One report states that when wives were asked the question, the most common answer was mental cruelty. Mental cruelty. We might call mental cruelty emotional abuse, because that's exactly what it is. And that's what mental cruelty is all about. But anyone want to venture a guess as to the complaint that filled the number two slot, mental cruelty number one, but here's a complaint that filled the number two slot and occurred nearly as frequently as mental cruelty. It's the word neglect. That was number two, neglect. Do you find that surprising? I find it totally surprising, but my wife probably wouldn't. Physical abuse isn't at the top of the list. Wouldn't you think physical abuse might be at the top of the list when it comes to the answer uh, that the unhappiest wives give for grounds of divorce? Physical abuse. It's not. In fact, it's surprising, even amazing to me, how many women will remain with husbands who do abuse them physically, and they stay in the relationship nonetheless. But no, it isn't physical abuse when it comes to uh, these wives who are asked to be more specific about they want, why they want a divorce. Infidelity is not at the top of that list either. Now, you'd think that, that uh, physical abuse, infidelity, you'd think they'd be right up there toward the top of the list, but they aren't, neither one. Alcohol isn't there. Alcoholism is not there. Addiction is not sitting at the top. And neither is fraud or criminal behavior or any of the other things we might consider more serious. Now, let me quote from a report. And this report was written by William F. Harley, Jr., Ph.D., who uh, is also a marriage counselor. And I found his report very interesting in my research. Uh, Dr. Harley states this. When all forms of spousal neglect are grouped together, we find that it, neglect, is far ahead of all the other reasons combined that women leave men. Neglect. What an interesting statement. Let me read just a bit more from this report because I believe that any study on marriage should include this information. Listen to what he says. I'm quoting Dr. Harley here again. Simply stated, women leave men when they are neglected. Neglect accounts for almost all of the reasons women leave and divorce men. And he's studying the statistics, folks. I have little trouble, he says, convincing most men that verbal and physical abuse are legitimate reasons for their wives to leave. Most men would agree with him, he says. And there has been increasing social pressure on men lately to avoid hurting their wives physically and verbally, which makes my job even easier, he states. And then he goes on. But neglect is much, a much tougher sell to tell a man that neglect is the issue. And it's also much more difficult to overcome than abuse. While it's the most important reason women leave men, it's hard to convince men that it is a legitimate reason, something they should avoid at all costs. Some of the common complaints, he writes, that I hear from women, still quoting him, is he ignores me except when he wants sex. He sits and watches television when he could be talking to me. He rarely calls me to see how I'm doing. He hurts my feelings, and he never apologizes. Instead, he tells me I'm too sensitive. Uh, most husbands are mystified by these complaints, writes Dr. Harley. They feel that their wives demand too much and that most other women would be ecstatic if married to them. <laughs> their wives have become spoiled, take their efforts for granted, and have unrealistic expectations. This is what Dr. Harley writes from his research. He's making some interesting points here, is he not? Do women really expect too much of their husbands? Or are men doing less for their wives than they should be doing? Uh, that's an interesting concept to ponder. The answer most likely depends on whether you're the male or the female in the marriage relationship. Um, 
Dr. Harley contends that it isn't the wives, that the wives want more effort from their men. Instead, they expect efforts in a different direction from their men. Let me apply what Dr. Harley is saying to the little boxes illustration we used uh, concerning the way that men are wired. And uh, You remember that illustration we used, uh, the difference in the way that God wired the minds of men and the minds of women? This was an illustration presented uh, um, primarily by Dr. Mark Gunger in his video series entitled Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. It's the illustration of men having compartmentalized minds. Uh, or little boxes, millions of little boxes in their minds or whatever, each representing a specific facet of that man's life. He has a box for his job. He has a box for this hobby. He has a, a, a box for sports, one for his car, one for his children, one for his church, one for his wife, one for this project, one for another project, uh, one for vacation, and on and on it goes. I think you get the point there, but being goal-oriented or project-oriented, we talked about how man primarily lives in one box at a time. Uh, this tells us that while a man is in a particular box, performing the role that box demands, fo focusing all of his attention on the role that box requires, all the other boxes in his mind are closed off. He's not living in that box at that time. Now, we're just using this in a manner of speaking here. This is the one-tracked mind men are so often accused of having. We live in one box or one compartment at a time. For example, as that man wakes in the morning, he might enter his breakfast box. That's his primary consideration. He proceeds from there to his workplace box where he's focused on performing the role that his work demands. In other, other words, he, he's in different boxes all day long. And when he wants to chill out, he goes into what we've called, or Dr. Gunger called, his nothing box. Um, we talked about how nothing is able to drive a wife crazy more than a, wife, uh, a husband who's in his nothing box because women aren't wired like men. Uh, they don't have a nothing box. Um, women's minds aren't as compartmentalized as men if we think about it in this respect. Rather than boxes, they have wires. <laughs> billions and billions of wires, Dr. Gunger states, all interconnected and going off in every which direction uh, and all firing at the same time. Women are often said to be more multitask capable than men. We've heard that statement. Each wire in their mind is connected to another wire, and all the wires seem to be firing it all at once. They're not living in only one box at a time. They're living throughout um, that, that one large room, in a manner of speaking. When we men get on a track or in a roll box, as the illustration has it, we remain in that box until it's time to leave that box and move into a different box. Uh, while we're in a box, the other boxes are out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. Um, women seem to have the capacity to be in numerous boxes all at the same time, as we said. They, they really don't have those com little compartments. They have interrelated, intertwined connections. Where do the problems come in, if his illustration is correct? And well, you can really see how it is in many uh, in many ways. But if you think back to what I said earlier, one of those boxes in a man's mind is labeled children. Another is labeled wife. When a man is in his children box, for instance, he may be trying to give his children his undivided attention. Um, that's very rare today, but uh, although being in the children box isn't something most men are known for, and we know that's a fact, uh, they should be in their children box uh, more often than not. But think about it. The same may be true when it comes to the compartment labeled wife. Uh, what happens when he leaves each compartment? Now, Dr. Harley illustrates, uh, illustrates it a, a different way right here. He likens those little boxes to a house with many rooms. Dr. Harley using Dr. Gunger's illustration. A man is goal-oriented, as we said. He can only be in one room at a time. So a man adds more and more rooms to his life or he decides to spend more of his time in a particular life room, when that happens, what begins to take place where his wife is concerned? Well, it becomes obvious, does it not? Uh, the room with the word wife inscribed on the door gets less and less of his attention because he's living in all these other life realm boxes, or room here in this case. There isn't nearly as much time for the room marked wife. Now he finds himself really out of time. Uh, put simply, that room begins to be neglected. Of course, when that man first met the love of his life, he practically lived in that room with her name written on the door. He couldn't stay out of that room when he first met her. There's something else wives want men to understand. 
Most men have a room marked physical intimacy. Now, that doesn't come as a surprise to husbands. And the way a man's mind is wired, he reasons that if he visits that room during the times of his choosing, he's visited the room marked wife. But that isn't the case as wives see that issue. Uh, what most men fail to understand is while the wife room and the physical intimacy room uh, are different, they're adjoining rooms. We might look at it in that sense. The room marked wife is a room unto itself. It's a different room from the one marked physical intimacy. Neglect the wife room and she'll not give you the key to the physical intimacy room. Um, and she alone holds that key. Uh, husbands have various rooms in their life house, and their dilemma is that they begin in many cases to spin themselves, spread themselves rather too thinly. And then they expect their wives to understand their dilemma and be perfectly happy and content with whatever time they get from the husband. I'll take the key to that physical intimacy room now, the husband says. And the wife says, no, I don't see it that way. <laughs> Uh, women are re relationally oriented, as we explained in an earlier lesson. Dr. Harley suggests a solution. Listen to his solution. He says the solution to that dilemma is for husbands to invite their wives into all the rooms a man has in his life. Now, this is his suggestion. In other words, welcome her to become a part of all the things that interest you. Invite her into all your rooms integrate her into your life so that she can become a part of those things that occupy your time and your thoughts. He states, without such integration, there can be no emotional bonding, no uniting of the spirit, no feeling of intimacy. Again, that's his solution. Uh, it may be all well and good, and it may be as it should be. Men should certainly not exclude their wives from areas of their lives. We know that. But I'm not convinced in my own mind, that every wife has an interest in all the rooms of her man's life. Um, I don't think it's a question of inviting your wife into all the rooms you've chosen to add on to your so-called life house. I believe it has a whole lot more to do with the priority you assign to the rooms that you visit. That's really the issue. Wives have their own interests, and most most, while wanting some level involvement of involvement in their husband's lives, they need their own time. Uh, a wife doesn't have to tag along, uh, uh, nor do many wives desire to be, have all that much integration in, in the rooms that their husbands live in. What does a wife desire? She desires that her husband make the room with her name on it his highest priority in life. That's what she wants. And as far as uh, this pastor is concerned anyway, she wants a preeminent or a foremost position in her man's heart and in his life. She wants her room to be the number one room in, her, in, in, in his life. After all, was God's human creation not given the preeminent place in God's mind? Were we not given the foremost place in his mind if he had us in mind before the creation of the world? Uh, there isn't any question uh, about it if the Bible is true and we know that it is we were foremost the word is preeminent folks in God's mind as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 clearly points out read it with me according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love uh, were we not first and foremost in God's mind when it came to the sacrifice of his very own son uh, when he made his son to be sin for us at Calvary. Did God the Father not have us in mind when it came to the resurrection of his son, the burial and resurrection of his son, and being joined to his son, uh, and having resurrection life in that union? Uh, why, sure he did. We were first and foremost in his mind. If God the Father put us first when his plan called for the sacrifice of his son on our behalf, if the God-man Jesus Christ put us first, which he did, when he gave himself for our sins so that we, the church, might... Uh, give the one who gave himself for us the preeminence the Father desires we give the head of the church, then it only stands to reason, folks, that we husbands who hold the headship position in the union relationship called marriage gives our, give our wives the preeminent place in our minds. How much of our lives do we spend in their room with them? Perhaps if we husbands did the giving first, as God the Father and God the Son did, the giving first, then our wives would be motivated to give us the place of preeminence God is calling upon them to give us. Uh, 
Just a thought, is it not? But what I wanted you to see is that preeminence is a word that goes both directions when it comes to Christ and the church. We were foremost in his mind uh, and his desire, having placed us there, is that we now, uh, that he now be given the foremost position in our minds. If a husband's greatest desire is that his wife gives him preeminence, uh, give him preeminence in her mind, then showing her the preeminent place she holds in her husband's mind is the direction that God would have us take in our marriages. Uh, so let's move on to the second need every husband will have in his marriage relationship with his wife. Uh, the first great need that every man will have in his relationship with his wife, as we already said, is that he be given the foremost place of consideration when it comes to his wife. Uh, the place of preeminence, we call it. But just as the wife has three great needs in her marriage relationship, needs the husband was, un was uniquely designed to fulfill. Husbands have three great needs as well. Preeminence is simply the first or primary need of every husband. Uh, this brings us to need number two of every husband. And if we go back to the parallel structure presented in Ephesians chapter 5 and the correlation between Christ's headship over the church and the husband's headship over his wife, we might ask the question, what else does God desire from the church over which he is the head? This should tell us another great desire every husband will have where his union partner is concerned. This is the second desire of every husband here, folks, if the parallel structure in Ephesians chapter 5 holds true. And if so, every husband will desire a place of confidence, uh, a place of administrative confidence, we might even add. Now, what do I mean by a place of confidence? This one's easy. Your husband needs to be your leader. We know that. And more than that, he is your leader. Uh, he is the leader. He's the head. More than that, he needs you to recognize his God's given position and be confident in his leadership. That's what every man needs. Number two. That's what a place of administrative confidence is all about. After all, God gave the husband a place of administration when God made the husband the head of the wife. Now, let's look at the verse once again. Now, you should be very familiar with this verse by now. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. So let's take them together. For the husband is the head of the wife in the same way that, or even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Now you might ask, how can I follow his leadership if I'm not confident he's leading properly? And I can tell you that's a whole lot of wives out there. Well, this is why a woman should know what to look for before she says yes to a man. <laughs> Unfortunately, the crazy love we talked about earlier, the chemistry love, the infatuation time we talked about earlier, oftentimes results in emotions governing the mind. We're looking for somebody. We want to find that somebody now. When emotions trump doctrine, uh, we can find that we've gotten ourselves in trouble. And this works both ways when it comes to marriage relationships. Men are just as apt, if not more so, to put doctrine aside and follow their emotions when it comes to the crazy love uh, aspect when it's in operation. Uh, notice what Christ did not say when he went up into the mountain in Matthew chapter 5. Let's go back to that account for a moment. I want you to see what he did not say. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he, Christ, went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now next comes what is commonly called the Beatitudes. But watch as Christ continues teaching when we come to verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time... Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now follow me closely as I read verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a man to lust after him hath committed adultery with him already in her heart. Interestingly enough, Christ was proving the reality of the indwelling sin nature and Israel's incapacity to keep the law sufficiently to merit a righteous standing before him through their performance. But in so doing, Christ didn't point to the woman, did he? Is that not interesting to you? Now, we understand, of course, the sin nature is equally resident in both men and women, and many of the younger women of our day aren't trying to hide that, believe it or not, but there wasn't any doubt when it came to the men and the thought life resident in their sin nature, was there? Christ was pointing to the sin nature in the man rather than the woman. I find that interesting. My point simply this. Lust has led many to choose unwisely when it comes to those they desire to marry. But that doesn't mean that a wife should not honor the position of headship that God's given to the man that she married. You see, the good news is that leadership can be learned. 
Leadership can be learned. Don't give up on that man you marry. God didn't leave it to the man to decide what seems to be right in his mind and then follow that course of action. That's stated in the book of Proverbs. Notice Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? <laughs> of death. When there was no king in Israel, God said through Isaiah, the prophet, every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. You'll remember that. But what about today, we might ask? Um, Paul, the apostle of grace, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, we have the ascended Lord of glory's words to us. We have his thinking in his words through the, the apostle God appointed for us, and that would be the apostle Paul. Therefore, we have his thinking. We have Christ's counsel. As we said earlier, Paul's writing to those who have believed his gospel. He's not writing to unbelievers to tell them how to conduct themselves in their marriage relationships. Paul's writing to believers. He's addressing those who Paul was hoping would be desirous of making God's word rightly divided, of course, their authority. Put simply, leadership can be learned. When God's word is the authority, a leader has only to follow God's word. There isn't an area of life where God's word is absent principle that can be applied when it comes to the decision-making process of those uh, that are under his leadership position. Uh, there's a direct doctrine most of the time and principle that can be applied all of the time to all areas of our lives. Uh, a case in point is God's call for godly wisdom through godly counsel. Uh, you probably remember that passage. There are three verses in Proverbs that speak to the issue of wise counsel. Listen to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Without counsel... Purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. What husband should think that he is the best qualified to make every decision in his married life, apart from the wise counsel that, be, that can be gained from his wife, his life partner? Certainly, when all counsel's been considered, it's up to the one holding the leadership to, position to make the final decision. But no decision should be rendered apart from considering the input of the marriage mate. Uh, think about the way it works in the business world for a moment. Uh, wise business owners include their employees in, in some of their decisions. Why would they bother to do that? For what purpose do they do that? Why would they take the time, expend the energy, when final decisions are really up to who? To those in the leadership position. They do it for a reason, folks. They do it not only to gain the ideas that employees can contribute, great ideas in many cases, but also so that their employees will feel more apart of the business operation. By soliciting the employee's opinions, business owners can increase team spirit. And did God not design marriages to be a team effort? Um, are marriage partners not to move from the I concept over to the we concept? In a marriage relationship, to become one flesh, according to the Bible. Now, it's been proven in the business world that as employee involvement increases, so does employee commitment to the company. And that's a fact. Can we learn something here, folks? Uh, are businesses simply applying without even knowing it what Scripture's known all along? Uh, if considering wise counsel works in the business world, what does that tell us about wise husbands? It tells every husband that they should listen, he should listen to his wife and give full consideration to her opinion. Tell someone what to do and that person will feel like an employee. Uh, they won't feel like an employee. They'll feel like a slave an employee slave, ask a person's opinion and that person will feel more like a partner. A wise husband acknowledges his wife as a partner, not an employee. Of course, no wife wants to be a slave to an inconsiderate husband. Uh, but let's take it a step further. What happens when a business owner allows the opinions of employees to actually impact the decision even when that business owner feels himself that the opinions he's, rec he's received may not be the best course of action for that business to take. Well, if it's something that will harm the company, the owner has to make the final call. But by allowing the employees to impact the course of action, even when that course of action may not be the best course of action that could be taken, an employer can, can help those employees to feel more connected to the company and more committed to that company's success. This is proven, folks. It's not always about the best decision. Sometimes the far more important consideration is an enhanced connection. 
Uh, wise employers know that and they operate accordingly. Could the impact on employee morale not outweigh a better choice in some situations? I think you can see the point that I'm trying to make here. The best business partner anyone could ever have is a partner that's fully committed to the success of the enterprise. It works the same way in marriage. Wives, husband, wise husbands will always listen to their wives' opinions and suggestions, and they'll take them seriously. The more involved a wife is in the, in the opening or the operating, rather, aspects of the marriage relationship, in the decisions that are being made, the more those decisions are a team effort. The more committed that wife will be to the success of the marriage relationship. Uh, that's how God designed the partner, partnering concept to work in the institution called marriage. Husbands need a place of administrative confidence. God should know. Uh, God is the one who designed the marriage relationship in the first place. He's also one, the one that designed the creatures, the, the, the creatures who would be taking part in that relationship. How many times has a wife's opinion been the best option? In my marriage, I can tell you in more cases than not. Uh, of course, a wise wife is a wife who honors her husband's God-given leadership position and believes in him, even though he'll not always make the best decisions. Uh, a man who has a wife who he knows believes in him is far more apt to work that much harder at being worthy of his wife's belief in his administrative ability. We know that Christ doesn't have to earn the trust of his creation. Uh, he already deserves our belief in him. Uh, he's already proven himself. But does the one who is the head of the church not desire that his creation believe in him? He certainly does. Uh, I'll quote the verse as you pick out the key words. Romans 10, 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever, key phrase, believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The context is believing on what Christ accomplished at Calvary, of course, so we won't stop with Romans 10, 11. Does Christ want the church to trust him in all things? Listen uh, to Romans chapter 15, verse 12. And again, Is Isaiah, or Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall reign, rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him, not on him here, in him, in this case, shall the Gentiles do what? Trust. Trust is another way of saying pin their hopes on, um, place their utmost confidence in. According to Paul, this is what Christ desires from the church over which he is the head. Uh, looking at the parallel structure, Paul presents then, this is what every husband will desire from his wife. As head of the church, Christ wants us to rely upon him. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to place our confidence in him. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to have faith in him. The scriptures are replete with how God would have the church be subject unto Christ in that regard. Our hope is in the Lord. Uh, here's another example in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore we labor and suffer reproach because we, and here it is, trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially in a special way for those that are believed, those who believe are joined to him. The words trust and believe are both in the same passage there. You see, if your husband is to be fulfilled in his marriage relationship, he needs for you to believe in him. That will be his secondary need other than preeminence. He needs for you to place your trust in him, to rely upon him, to depend upon him, uh, to have confidence in him. Who is usually the first person to come along and let a, a husband know when he's royally screwed things up? Uh, more often than not, it's his wife. She's usually the first one to let him know where, where and how he's done the wrong thing. Uh, who should be the last person on earth to do that? According to the parallel structure we're seeing, we're seeing in Ephesians chapter 5. And what Paul's showing us here, the answer should be clear by now. The last person who should be constantly pointing out his failures is his wife. You see, the world will tear a man down. Uh, he doesn't need his wife to take on that role. The world will pr uh, present enough misery for a man to lose faith and begin to lose faith and confidence in himself. The last person who needs to lose faith and confidence in him is his wife. Uh, when the world would tear him down, when he's, when he's discouraged, when he begins to lose confidence in himself, and he'll not tell you when that happens, but it will happen, and in his abilities, his wife is the very person that God designed to come along and build him up. God designed her to be her husband's encourager. Do you see the word there? To pour the courage in when courage is running out, uh, not to be his discourager. Some wives become discouragers rather than encouragers. Uh, think about some of the statements. Well, if you would only. Why didn't you? There you go again. You should have. You shouldn't have. You always. 
You never, fill in the blanks, if you had only listened to me, what did I tell you earlier? What did I say about that? Do you see the difference here? Which is more important, to be right or to let your husband know that even when he's wrong, your money's riding on him to do what's right? You see, we make being right the first and foremost, that's the first and foremost mind in the sin nature, to be right. So we oftentimes have to prove we are right. And many arguments have taken place when it comes to Bible doctrine and the area we should go in Bible doctrine. When somebody insists on being right and an argument happens, and this being right battle uh, takes place in the minds of husbands and wives. You can win a battle, to be sure, but you can lose a war in the process. You can win more fights than you lose. But is winning the fights worth losing your marriage? And I can tell you, this is where it come, the rubber meets the road in a lot of marriages. When things are going downhill, and when the world, especially his world, seems to be tumbling down, you, as his wife, may be the one who comes along to say, I don't doubt you for a moment. You can do it. I know you can do it. Sure, things may not have turned out like you or I, uh, either one of us had hoped they would turn out, but I have confidence in you to fix what's broken. My money's riding on you. That's what every husband needs, folks. Husband needs their, husbands need their wives to believe in them. They're far more apt to do the right thing when they have a wife who is confident they will do the right thing. Uh, you've all heard this song. It comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I'll read the verse. You'll recognize the song that was taken from this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Now, that gives you a little clue. Paul was suffering, yet he was not ashamed. Why was he not ashamed? For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. You see, the, you see the concept there we're trying to point out? That's giving your husband a place of administrative confidence, a place of confidence in your life that you're showing him. That is being subject to your husband as the church is to be subject unto Christ in all things. Uh, now, let's... Let's look at the third need of every husband in our remaining time here. Like the two desires of the husband that came before it, this is also something that Christ desires from the church. It's that parallel structure of Ephesians 5 jumping back at us again. This desire of Christ from the church is also, like the ones before it, something that is evident throughout Scripture. Regardless of the dispensation, we could say this is trans-dispensational. Um, since Christ, the head of the church, desires it from the church, we can be fairly certain that this is going to be a desire of every man from his wife. A husband's desire number one, again, a place of preeminence. Husband's desire number two, a place of confidence. Every husband's desire number three, a place of administration. Or, I'm sorry, admiration. Administration was first. Admiration. Preeminence, confidence, admiration. Now, all three are included in the word reverence, believe it or not. A synonym of which is admiration. Um, all things... All things the head of the church desires to receive from the church. Likewise, three things, if the parallel structure holds true, that um, are desired, will be desired by the husbands who are the head of their wives uh, and want to receive from their wives. Tell me if you see these things in the Old Test these Old Testament passages that I'm going to put up before you here. Uh, the first is Deuteronomy 10.21. I told you it's, uh, it goes all the way back. He is thy what? Praise. And he is thy God. Now, match that up with 1 Chronicles 29, 13, another Old Testament passage. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Uh, here's another, Psalms 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Um, every husband needs the praise and admiration of those under his headship. Paul concurs here. Here it is in Romans 15, 11. And again, do what does Paul say? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and do what? Laud him, all you people. How many husbands feel that from their wives? How many husbands experience that from their wives? How many wives are doing that very thing when it comes to their men? Paul isn't finished, folks. Ephesians 1.12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. To laud means to commend. It means to admire, and it means to compliment. Now, you'd think those are the things a wife needs. Well, the wife certainly does need those things, but so does the husband. Do you show admiration for your husband by the compliments that you give your husband? Something to think about. Do you commend your husband? 
Well, the fact is he needs it to be perfectly fulfilled in his marriage relationship. You cannot tell me there's not something for which you can compliment that man that you married. Uh, do you do it publicly or do you only do it privately and only from time to time? Does your husband sense your appreciation and admiration? Do your attitudes and actions reflect your respect and admiration for the man you marry? A place of preeminence, a place of confidence, a place of admiration. These are the three greatest needs of every husband, according to scripture, if the parallel structure holds true. A safe place, a special place, a place of closeness. These are the three greatest needs of every wife, as we've already seen. Uh, the scripture bears us out over and over and over again. They're all sitting there in that parallel structure of Ephesians chapter 5. When we consider how Christ loved the church and what Christ desires from the church. It's all sitting here for us, folks. Uh, God designed not only the, uh, the marriage institution, he designed the creatures to take part in that marriage institution, and he designed the marriage manual telling how each creature, being the wired different, equal but wired different, needs to operate in order to, uh, to be the, the most effective uh, when it comes to their marriage relationship. Now, we've got a minute or two remaining, so let me bring this section to a close with just a few additional thoughts here for you. We've said a lot about marriage. Uh, we've covered a whole lot in these last uh, 12, 13 lessons. But we've not said nearly all that could be said about this wonderful union relationship um, that came from the drawing board of heaven, by the way. How about marital conflict? That's the worst thing that can happen in marriage, right? Marital conflict. Fighting in marriage is not a good thing. Or is it? Would you believe that it is, in fact, just the opposite of what most would think? Fighting in marriage can indeed be a good thing. Here's an interesting statistic of which you may not have been aware. I certainly wasn't. Research shows that the number one predictor of divorce is the habitual avoidance of conflict. Is that not surprising? Yet it's true. A couple that does not fight is at the greatest risk of divorce. Avoiding conflict through conflict resolution is a good thing. Uh, uh, Avoiding conflict for the sake of running from the problem is just the opposite. It's a bad thing. When someone says we never talk because when we talk, we fight, that's not a good sign. One marriage counselor said, and I agree with him fully, there's nothing more damaging to your marriage than not fighting. Uh, to get truly angry with someone, you have to care about that person on some level. Um, hate is a hair's breadth from love, as some have said. Uh, sometimes the people we are most comfortable with, the people we are closest to and least frightened of losing, see the people, are, are, are the very people we treat the worst. Is, is that not ironic? Uh, it isn't that fighting is healthy for a marriage and that we should all go out and pick a fight with our life mate, uh, but the fact is people in healthy marriages fight. Believe it or not, <laughs> they've just learned how to fight if they're successful without destroying one another in the process. A healthy fight is about discussing differences and working through conflicts to come to, to conflict resolution. If you want to be happily married, you have to learn how to fight. You have to learn to fight right, as we might say. And what does that mean? That means the avoidance of anger. Uh, there will be irreconcilable differences with anyone you might pick as a partner. But avoiding words that injure and demean a marriage partner is the way to fight right. Uh, avoiding personal attacks while speaking honestly about how you feel is what fighting right is all about. Do you remember what Paul said about Peter in the book of Galatians? Let's quickly look back there, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Do you think for a moment that Paul didn't care about Peter and that uh, Paul and Peter were enemies? Uh, I submit to you that Paul loved Peter greatly and that that didn't hinder Paul from being honest with Peter. Um, but that's, it really helped him to be honest with Peter. The Greek dictionary says this about the word translated withstood. It says oppose, do battle with, clash with, be in conflict with. Paul did battle with Peter in the sense that a conflict had arisen over Peter's actions. Do you suppose Paul said a, a lot of mean things to Peter, demeaned Peter, put him down personally? Or do you suppose that Paul told Peter where and why he disagreed with what Peter was doing? and that Peter knew full well while Paul was speaking 
that the apostle of grace cared for him and he cared equally as much for the apostle Paul. What words did Peter use later on down the road to describe the apostle Paul, the one with whom he had been in conflict? Here are those words in 2 Peter 3.15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our next two words, beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Fighting can be healthy when those who fight have learned to fight right. Fighting right is honestly stating a position that's held without an attack on the person of a different persuasion. Fighting right is about honestly stating a position for the purpose of conflict resolution. Don't lose hope if you fight. Fighting can indeed show, be proof that there is hope. Uh, just learn how to fight right, and, and that's without an angry attitude and without angry words. I hope that some of the things that we've talked about over the course of these past 13 weeks um, have helped. I know that some in our broad listening audience have reached that state of comfortable love we talked about earlier and uh, they've moved beyond the need for marriage lessons while others have already given up hope for marriage improvement uh, and have no desire whatsoever for marriage lessons then there are those who are of the younger set uh, who desperately need to hear the things we've taught and uh, so that they can avoid or overcome some of the pitfalls that some of us other older folks have fallen into in our marriage relationships it, this marriage these marriage lessons are for those folks. Uh, I hope they, they've helped and I hope it's given some food for thought to those who are contemplating marriage and perhaps some guidelines when it comes to choosing the one with whom you can experience what we call or what God would call the hallmark of human happiness when it comes to human relationships and that's the relationships called marriage. Uh, so we'll close it there with that and we may add a message down the road later on to this series. Uh, thank you for listening.